Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My next guest was administrator of the provisional government in Iraq following the 2003 invasion. Appointed by George W. Bush, he has a unique perspective on the unrest in the region and the rise of the Islamic State. He's been intimately involved in counterterrorism for over three decades, and he's here to talk about his experience in Iraq and offer his assessment of the current threat posed by ISIS. Ambassador Paul Bremer, welcome to The World Over. Nice to be with you. Great to see you. Uh, I want to start going back. In 1999, you were appointed to a commission on counterterrorism, and that commission proffered a report in 2000. It was ignored by not one, but really two presidents. Tell me about that report and how it sets the stage, if you will, for what we're seeing today. This was a bipartisan report, mm -hmm. uh, unanimous conclusion was that we faced a new threat from growing Islamic extremism during the 90s. We had seen it grow. Um, and that we should expect these terrorists to carry out or attempt to carry out attacks on the homeland on a Pearl Harbor scale. Wow. And um, we made a number of recommendations, 40 or 45 recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, none of these were carried out by either the end of the Clinton administration or the early Bush administration until after 9-11. Wow. Now, you were brought in after the invasion, really after Iraq had been taken. Um, I want you to look, given, given that experience, at what we're seeing today. Let's start in Syria. This is where this whole ISIS uprising really took place. But now we're learning in the New York Times just today Many of these Syrian malcontents, uh, Iraqi malcontents, came out of the Ba'athist Party, uh, a party that you said, look, we have to make sure these people are not part of the government in Iraq. Right. Do you feel any responsibility for that? Do you think that may have fed the growth of ISIS in retrospect? You know, I've seen reports that there are some of these guys from the former army or mm -hmm. Ba'athists in ISIL. I've frankly never seen any actual evidence, but I don't exclude the possibility. On the other hand, uh, it's important to remember exactly what we did. First, in terms of the Ba'ath Party, we said only the top 1% of the party are out, which means they can't be in the government anymore. Mm -hmm. They can set up a business, they can become journalists, they can right. be farmers. Uh, secondly, in terms of the army, what we did was create a national army. And that national army, with American training, defeated al-Qaeda in Iraq by the end of 2009, as President Obama and Vice President Biden have admitted. This war was won, and it was won by the Iraqi army, trained by the Americans, mm -hmm. with our help, by the end of 2009. So the situation we face today is really a reflection of what's happened in the last two and a half years. It's not a reflection of what happened more than 10 years ago. You, you don't think it speaks to the instability of the Maliki government? I mean, and the way he was acting out, uh, making sure that uh, Sunnis were sort of kept on the margins. That seems to be the president's implication, as we'll hear in a moment. Well, al-Maliki, uh, certainly after we decided to withdraw our troops at the end of 2011, mm -hmm. decided on and pursued a very heavily sectarian pro-Shia policy. Mm -hmm. He put out an arrest warrant for his vice, his Sunni vice president 24 hours after the president said we're going to pull our troops out. Mm -hmm. He stopped cooperating with the Kurds on the sharing of oil revenues. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, in the last two years, he has purged a lot of those American trained officers right down to the brigade level in the Iraqi army. Mm -hmm. So that when ISIL came to Mosul mm -hmm. earlier this year, the elements of that army simply collapsed. Well, uh -huh. if you know anything about the military, you know that a unit fights for its officers and NCOs. You have to uh -huh. trust them. Al-Maliki had put his colleagues and cohorts in those positions, and it's not surprising that the men would not fight for him. So I put a lot of, uh, of the uh, blame on Mr. Al-Maliki, but in a way, by pulling our troops out at the end of 2011, we made it inevitable yeah. that a man like him was going to have to say, well, I've got to look after myself. But, but, but didn't President Bush in 2008 sign that agreement that basically committed to the withdrawal of troops, not combat troops, but troops from the region by 2012? 
He signed a status of forces agreement, right. SOFA, it's called in the mm -hmm. diplomatic Speak, world, yeah. uh, which was to expire, as it did at the end of 2011, but as President Bush made clear publicly at the time and has made clear in his book after, mm -hmm. it was always the intention to have troops stay there afterwards in significant numbers, probably 10 to 20. To maintain 000. order and give that Iraqi government well, the to best. To do three things, to help police the, uh, the, the line between the Kurdish and Arab sections, mm -hmm. two, to continue training of the Iraqi armed forces, mm -hmm. three, to help them with intelligence, which is really key, and four, to help them with planning, including using our special forces uh, in some operations against terrorists. All of those things were lost when Obama decided to pull out our troops. Mm -hmm. Now, President Obama, a year ago, almost to the day, uh, wanted to go in and bomb al-Bashir in Syria which would have only empowered ISIS, it seems. Now, a year later, we're sharing intelligence with them. Is there an incoherence here in the policy? The president has two red lines that are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. His first red line was, Assad must go. He said it right. four or five years ago. It's, been, it's still the policy. In fact, he said in his press conference today mm -hmm. that his policy in Syria is still regime change. He didn't use the word, but he talked yeah. about getting a Sunni group to run Syria. Well, a Sunni group means it's not going to be Assad. Mm -hmm. So uh, he still has a regime change red line on Syria. Then, in his New York Times interview three weeks ago, he said very clearly, it is our policy to prevent the establishment of an Islamic caliphate in Iraq and Syria. A good idea Unquote. or a bad idea? Very good idea, and he's right. It, it would be against our interests. Okay. Those two red lines are in conflict with each other. Mm. Mm. So how, how do you resolve this? Uh, let's play the president from today, okay. and I want you to react. Here's the president on what this crisis is and how to solve it. In order for us to degrade ISIL over the long term, we're going to have to build a regional strategy. Now, we're not going to do that alone. We're going to have to do that with other partners, in particularly Sunni partners, because part of the goal here is to make sure that Sunnis, both in Syria and in Iraq, feel as if they've got an investment in a government that actually functions, a government that uh, can protect them, uh, a government that uh, makes sure that their families are safe from the barbaric acts that we've seen in ISIL. And right now, uh, those structures are not in place. And that's why uh, the issue with respect to Syria is not simply a military issue, it's also a political issue. It's also uh, an issue that involves all the Sunni states in the region and Sunni leadership recognizing that this cancer that has developed uh, is one that they have to be just as invested in defeating as we are. Your reaction to that? Well, I think the president is right. It's important in, when the new government is pulled together by al that mm -hmm. it has a broader uh, footprint with the Kurds and the Sunnis. I, I, I think that's correct. But what's a little bit unsettling about the president's statement is it implies that ISIL has been successful in Iraq because it has substantial political support in Iraq, and that's simply not true. I would, I would guess that the support, public support for ISIL in Iraq is something like 2 percent at best. These are people, we know the story, who crucify children, bury people alive, rape women, rape men, behead Americans. I mean, uh, I'm reminded of uh, a paraphrase, you know, Lincoln once said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Uh -huh. If ISIL is not evil, there is no evil. evil. Yeah. So, and it's an evil that is directed against America. Now, mm. the president said it was a problem to us. If indeed it is a problem to us, then in fact, how the Iraqi government solves its political problems doesn't affect our interest in stopping ISIL. Mm -hmm. I happen to think he's right. It would be better if we had an Iraqi government that's broader. But don't we have to figure out who's the enemy? Is it Iran or is it ISIL? Is it, is it you know, Bashar, uh, Bashir or is it... Uh, we have to figure this out. And it seems we have these conflicting, as you said a moment ago, conflicting red lines, conflicting agendas in the Middle East. Well, uh, not uniquely in the world, the Middle East is a place where very often you have more than one enemy. Yeah. Uh, I'm, there is a long-term problem with Iran, uh, which mm -hmm. is Iran's uh, quest for a nuclear weapon. Right. At the moment, uh, the thing we have to worry about with ISIL is exactly what my 
National Commission on Terrorism pointed out more than 10 years ago, yeah. 12 years ago, which is these people are interested in and capable of attacks on the American homeland. And you now have, as we know, mm -hmm. Americans who don't need any visa to come home. They right. just have to show their American passport. You got maybe mm -hmm. a couple of thousand Europeans. Yeah. Uh, and they have said, the, uh, the uh, ISIL leaders have said, we're coming after you. I think we need to take that seriously. So, so we have an interest in the defeat of ISIL, irrespective of the question of how the Iraqi government is finally re uh, put right. together. You heard what the president said there, though. Is it possible at this moment to have a stable Iraqi government and Iraqi military, given that factions of it, the military, have already peeled off and they're now fighting with ISIL on the ground? Can you have that? You, tr you all tried to give and create a civil society there. Uh, as Pat Buchanan has said, Idaho in Mesopotamia. Uh, is it possible? Well, the, the, several different, you've asked several questions. Uh, first of all, the Iraqi army is in the process of reconstituting. They have been active in the north mm -hmm. and in the south and in Baghdad. And most importantly, they have been active against ISIL in Anbar province, which is the primary uh, Sunni region to the west of the capital. Mm -hmm. So the Iraqi army is in the process of reconstituting itself and is having an effect against ISIL. Secondly, I think it is possible for al-Abadi, the new prime minister designate, to put together a broader-based government, and I think the president's right. It would certainly be in our interest that he does that. Mm -hmm. ISIL is not 10 feet tall. They have an ideology that is repugnant yeah. to the vast majority of Iraqis. They have vulnerable lines of communication, vulnerable to, particularly to air strikes, and they have vulnerable supply and refitting uh, stations, some of them in Syria which is where the question comes about mm -hmm. attacks into Syria. So I think ISIL can be handled, can be defeated. But because it's an ideology, right, and, and, and a religious one, or at least a, it has a, the, the look of a religious one, suddenly, I mean, in the New York Times today, it says many of these officers who were sectarian, who were, who were secular, suddenly one day they wake up, they've got religion, and it was after the, you know, after right. the United States exerted some control there. I want to read to you something, and this is from the Patriarch. This is uh, Louis Sacco, and he says, the U.S. is indirectly responsible for what's going on in Iraq. He said the American leaders promised to bring democracy to Iraq, but 10 years later, uh, on the contrary, we have gone backward. Your reaction? Well, first, I have great respect for the Patriarch, uh, but what we're seeing today is the fourth successive peaceful transfer of power in Iraq in the last 10 years. They've had six elections. Mm -hmm. All of this so far has been done in accordance with a constitution that was written by and approved by the Iraqi people. There is no other country in the Arab Middle East that can make those claims. Now, it's a very imperfect democracy. Mm -hmm. I will certainly agree with the patriarch about that. It is a democracy. Mm. Do you think, and I've gotten this email throughout the, the day when, I, when people heard you were coming on, weren't we better? Wasn't the Middle East more stable? Weren't Christians in a better place when Gaddafi, Mubarak, and Hussein were sitting on their regimes and fully active? Well, it is certainly the case that the last decade has been very cruel to Christ the Christian community uh, in Iraq and, and throughout the region. There's no question about that, and it is, it is a heartbreaking uh, consequence. Uh, I would argue that I, the only case I know well is Iraq, of yeah. those three. Uh, the Iraqi people are demonstrably better off today than they were under Saddam Hussein. I put the Christians in a corner here because mm. it is true that they have been very badly handled and, and the, the population is no, diminishing. They yeah, they can't but practice their faith, which they could under Hussein. That's true. Uh, but the Iraqi people are much better off today on the whole. I, 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 I can't, it seems to me, you can't judge our policy just on the basis of what's happened to the Christians, though as a yeah. Christian it certainly hurts me. Yeah. Um, per capita income is six times what it was when I left Iraq in 2004. In 10 years, a 600 percent increase in per capita income. Yeah. Cellular phones are there, newspapers are finally free, they have free freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And for all the violence, nonetheless, life goes on there. Now, I, I, 
I grant you the point about the Christians. Yeah, I, I mean, Ambassador, when you're talking about you know, people running for their lives and, and, and right. babies on platters of rice being boiled and, and beheadings. Uh, it's hard to count the cell phones and the per capita as, a, as an advantage when, when they're running for their lives and you've got these human rights violations. I'm not saying that, I, I'm not suggesting that one policy created this, but I, I, are they demonstratively better today, you think? Well, I think they are, but you know, one is, one is uh, yeah. free to take whatever conclusion you want. The, the, the facts are they live in a democracy. They have peacefully transferred power. They have a constitution. But the democracy is uh, overrun now. And it, and it, it mm -hmm. seems this ISIS is in the process. They're moving toward Baghdad. And, and as you have pointed out, if they move into Baghdad and take Baghdad and encroach upon the Shiite holy sites, right? what happens then? All hell breaks loose. Well, I, I'm making the assumption that mm -hmm. the United States government will continue its policy of supporting the Iraqis to defeat ISIL. And mm -hmm. I believe ISIL can be defeated. Though, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs pointed out earlier this week, yep. it will require us to take action in Syria. And the president has a difficult decision to make there about carrying the air battle uh, into Syria. Mm. So my statement reflects the situation today. Obviously, if ISIL continues southward, takes Baghdad, reaches Karbala and Najaf, the holy cities, then it will be a whole different, uh, uh, whole different situation. What happens then? Iran jumps into the fight? Uh, I would, yes. I, they will not allow the holy cities to be uh, taken over by these guys. Mm. Uh, I, by the way, I don't think that'll happen. Uh, no. I mean, in fact, I don't think they'll uh, succeed in taking Baghdad. They've, they, the Iraqi government has put a ring of military around around Baghdad. And in fact, the southward movement of ISIL has actually stopped in some ways slowed down in the last couple of weeks. Mm. Uh, while we're on this, the religious dimension of all of this, and right. you, in your in your piece in the Wall Street Journal, you, you talked about this um, but by sounding warnings just like this one about uh, taking these Shiite holy sites. Have we been tone deaf to the religious implications that drive so much of this and motivate so many of these players in the Middle East? Well, I go back to the National Commission on Terrorism we started talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it was certainly the case that in the 1990s, a lot of intelligence was around showing that an extreme wing of, the, uh, of Islam, uh, nobody knew the name, Al-Qaeda, yeah. uh, was gaining strength. And it is clear that ISIL is sort of the... the the son or the grandson of Al Qaeda. It in has Iraq. the same in Iraq. Mm -hmm. It has the same uh, very extreme views. Uh, effectively, it's interesting that they use the term caliphate. There hasn't been a caliph in the Muslim world for more than a hundred years. Oh, well, you've got one uh, now. This Baghdadi is saying he is the caliph. Right. But it, what I'm saying is it shows a backward-looking view of Islam mm -hmm. that is radical and, in my view, has actually not got very much political support in Iraq, as I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. Mm. Let's move on and talk about the threat America may be facing uh, from ISIS. I want to share this with you. This is Mike Rogers, who's on the Intelligence Committee in the House. Here's what he had to say. We've heard a ramping up of the rhetoric by the administration. How significant a threat is ISIS? Oh, it's a very real threat. And you saw the, the, the very barbaric behavior. And one of the problems is it's gone unabated for nearly two years. And that draws people from, you know, from Britain to across Europe, even the United States, to go and join the fight. They see that as a winning ideology, a winning strategy, and they want to be a part of it. And that's what makes it so dangerous. They are one plane ticket away from U.S. shores. And that's why we're so concerned about it. Do you share his concern? Yes, I do. Uh, you know, the 9-11 attack, uh, we think, cost less than a million dollars and involved 19 hijackers. Um, if indeed there are hundreds of Europeans and Americans, maybe thousands of them now, yeah. fighting, they're getting battle-hardened and they're being inculcated with this extreme view. Uh, and as uh, Chairman Rogers said, you know, all they got to do is get a plane ticket. They don't have to get a visa if they've got American mm. passports or British passports or French mm -hmm. passports. So I think we should be we should be concerned. Uh, whether they can conduct something right now or in the next months, I don't know. Yeah. But we were surprised by 9/11, and we don't want to be surprised again. How do you repel 
the attraction to the ideology. That's what's driving this. It's, it's young people who feel they have to join this fight, that, that somehow Islam is being shortchanged or their, their options are running out. How do, you, how do you fight against that? It's a religion, isn't it beneath the surface, a religious and an ideological tug of war? Well, yes. I mean, you can get lots of scholars of Islam who are more knowledgeable than I am. In the end, uh, the vast majority of Muslims are not terrorists. The vast number, majority of terrorists are Muslims. Mm -hmm. Those are two facts. Mm -hmm. The moderate Muslims who don't share this radical ideology primarily have to win this fight. I mean, it's a fight we can help them with, but it's a fight in the end that the moderates mm -hmm. in Egypt or Iraq or Syria have to win they With seem to help. be awfully quiet, Ambassador. The, uh, yes, and and I must say the diaspora Muslims mm -hmm. uh, are not as active as they should be denouncing uh, mm -hmm. denouncing these extremists, particularly the ones in Europe. Um, so, when you say how do we win it, I don't think we win it. I think Islam has to win this fight. Mm. There there have been threats now, specific threats made against the U.S. homeland in Times Square, Las Vegas, Chicago, the White House. Are we more? safe now than we were 12 years ago? You know, I'm not privy to the intelligence that uh, the government has right now, so I, I can't give a, a knowledgeable answer to that. My instinct tells me that if you'd asked me that a year ago, I would have said, I think we're better off. Mm -hmm. Now I'm concerned because I think Chairman Rogers, who does see the intelligence, oh. is obviously very concerned. and that we ought to pay attention to mm -hmm. his conclusion. There was a report this afternoon late from the Washington Post, and it seems the American hostages of ISIS, including James Foley, who was beheaded, were waterboarded many times. Was that a mistake in strategy for the Bush administration to have that practice of waterboarding? Apparently, they are copying the techniques that they were subject to yeah. when they were imprisoned. Yeah. Uh, all I can, t I can't add much to what's in the public domain other than to say that people who were involved with the intelligence that was gathered as a result of waterboarding mm -hmm. say it was an effective way to get intelligence that saved American lives. Mm -hmm. Now, you can then have a long debate about whether it was an appropriate right. way to treat them. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, it is not a simple black and white question because mm -hmm. if you posit a situation where we have captured a terrorist who's involved with a group that has a small nuclear weapon they're going to set off in Cincinnati right. and he refuses to talk, uh, is there a limit to what you would do to get the information from him if you assume that waterboarding produces information? And the record mm -hmm. shows apparently that it does produce information. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe he makes it up. There are a lot of, but it's not a straightforward black and white question, in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there have certainly been people raising it and saying, look, this is a moral, this crosses the moral line. Well, this is I can understand that. And I, 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 I'm sympathetic to people who say it crosses a moral line. Mm -hmm. But I'm also mindful, having worked against terrorists now for almost 30 years, that you can't exclude the possibility that a time arises, a situation arises where urgent need for intelligence produces a question that is much harder. Mm -hmm. Do we let the bomb go off in Cincinnati mm -hmm. because we decided to obey our moral uh, precepts? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, not, it's not black and white. It's a tough one. Ambassador yeah. Paul, thank you for being here. Nice to here. be with you. Thank you.